Um, my name is Lindsay Haynes. I'm here with my teammate, Andrew McDonald, and we're from Slack um, from the, on the video conferencing team. And we're here to talk to you about, first, Andrew's going to give um, a bit of overview of the technical side of Slack and the technical architectures that we use. And then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges um, that we've faced in building video conferencing and how we've overcome them and some lessons that we've learned in that. Um, so what is Slack? As you may not know, um, Slack is a, a workplace collaboration application. So you can message each other. Um, you can build apps into the tool. You can share files. And most importantly, you can video conference each other, which is our team that we work on. So you can audio call, video call, and screen share call. And I'll pass it off to Andrew to talk about the technical side. Thanks, Lindsay. So first, I want to talk about uh, the timeline of the project to give you an idea of the kind of resources it would take to build something like this, both in time and people. Uh, so our story starts with the acquisition of Screen Hero in early 2015. Screen Hero is a small company uh, that did voice calling and uh, multi-user remote collaboration, like remote desktop control. Um, and it was a little over a year later that the first uh, offering from Slack launched, uh, group voice calling. And um, so why did that take so long? Uh, a few insights into that. One was uh, a serious overhaul of the uh, Screen Hero code into, to, to better integrate into Slack. Um, another big piece of that was uh, launching mobile apps um, or like mobile calling um, functionality into the mobile apps. Uh, Screen Hero didn't have that at all. So that, that formed a large part of that. Uh, not relatively soon thereafter, we launched group video calling uh, and then screen sharing. And as of just Wednesday, I believe this week, we're happy to announce interactive screen sharing, um, uh, which yes. which uh, completes the, the vision of Screen Hero, the like kind of version one uh, intent of, of bringing um, Screen Hero into Slack. And so now we're excited to see what happens, happens next. Uh, so over the lifetime of the project, we averaged about six developers. So it gives you some kind of idea of how much it takes to build something like this. Um, I'm going to start talking about the uh, client infrastructure first. Um, and as a workspace collaboration app, uh, Slack is very much, or not very much, but like at least from our perspective, is focused on uh, desktop platforms more than mobile platforms. We, we have a lot more usage on desktop, so I'm going to focus on that. Um, so Slack's a web application, but it's perhaps somewhat, we're in the perhaps somewhat uncommon position of also shipping native desktop apps. Um, and we do that using a, a technology, a platform called Electron. Um, and for anyone who's not familiar with that, it's uh, kind of like a stripped down browser. It actually runs uh, the core parts of Chromium, uh, plus the uh, ability to do uh, additional native-like functionality. So um, either through the Electron API itself or through uh, custom node modules, native node modules that you can add on. Um, so in, inside Chromium in Electron, we're using um, WebRTC. Um, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, actually, until like pretty recently, we were rolling our own WebRTC libs from the uh, standalone WebRTC repository. And uh, so we've moved away from that recently. I wanted to explain uh, why, why we took that route. Um, the, there were two problems with it. One was for a team our size, the, the maintenance cost of uh, maintaining builds and accepting upstream updates from standalone WebRTC was, um, uh, was, we found it to be, to be too much actually. Um, and to the point where um, updates to Chromium and Electron were happening much faster than we could update our own standalone uh, WebRTC version. Uh, the, the other piece is that in the WebRTC stack, there's actually uh, large chunks of it that are implemented in Chromium proper. And, uh, the counterparts to those pieces in the standalone WebRTC repo uh, are not, uh, I mean, it's basically the, the code is language to a certain extent, and so there's, there's some bugs and so on. And so by switching over to, to Chromium stack, we, we um, actually improved the experience for our users quite a bit. Um, so you know, even if you're building uh, a native uh, desktop app that's um, built on WebRTC, I would strongly consider uh, or like suggest that you consider this route of, of using Electron. Um, just to give you one example of how uh, Electron has helped us, um, in our interactive screen sharing feature, uh, the host needs to be able to see uh, the guest virtual cursors on their screen. And so here we have an example where uh, mine and Lindsay's cursors are, are visible by the host. 
And uh, to do this, we have a, a transparent, always on top window overlay. And um, that's just the kind of thing, or an example of the kind of thing that you can't do in a, in a vanilla web application. Um, so we really feel that uh, Electron with WebRTC built into Chromium has, is kind of like the best of both worlds for us. It lets us uh, move quickly with WebRTC, but also provide some native-like functionality to our users. Um, one other thing I want to talk about is network topologies. And so we've heard a bunch about this today, and so I won't go into it too deeply. Uh, but the main thing I want to point out is that in Slack, we always use uh, an FSU-based topology. We're not actually doing peer-to-peer -peer at all right now. And that was uh, originally based on the idea that, again, Slack is like a workplace collaboration app would have uh, a large proportion of calling uh, as group calls. But that turned out simply not to be the case. Um, and our data is, shows that like 80 to 90% of our calls are actually one to one. So uh, we're now definitely reconsidering that and uh, looking at uh, a hybrid model where we can use both peer to peer and SFU based calls. OK, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit how uh, we scale calls around the world and then get on to some of the challenges that we faced. So um, first off, we're in six different regions around the world. Um, we use AWS and Google. And we have something called region servers. So um, whenever a client wants to connect to one of our media servers, they ask a region server, hey, what's the closest media server to me? Um, they get that, and then they connect to that one uh, media server. We use a really simple load balancing algorithm so that um, participants or users, whoever starts the call, gets the least loaded server when they start the call. Um, there is one, one problem with this. So we are only using one SFU to host a call. And some, some challenges we found with this is we can't plan for load. So we can host up to 15 people on a call. And when someone starts a call, we don't know how many users are going to be on that call. We just know that there's one person when they started it. So a bunch of people could start a call on a server, and then they could all grow to 15 people. And then that's a huge amount of load for our servers. So it's hard to plan loads. Um, it also makes for long and difficult deploys. So every time we deploy, we do a drain stop. And we have to have two sets of servers running. And then that's a lot more money is since you're, you have two sets of servers running and you're slowly draining off the old servers to move everyone onto the new servers. And it takes about 24 hours to do this. Um, the third downside in just having one SFU. So in this example, we have, say, um, you, you start a call in the US, and a lot of your teammates who are close to you all join on that same SFU in the US, and you have one teammate in Australia, and they have to join on the same SFU that's hosted in the US. So they're using the public internet to connect to that SFU that's in the US, and that can make for a lot more latency than we'd prefer. So right now, we're trying to move to a multi-host SFU model. So we can have better load balancing. Instead of one person kicking up a call on one server, it can be hosted on many servers. Um, so we don't have to worry about a bunch of 15-person calls all coming up on one server. Um, another reason is we can use the private fiber of AWS or Google, and we can get um, packets to our customers a lot faster. So we're slowly moving to this um, multi-host multi model and hopefully can get these advantages as soon as possible. Um, another challenge I want to talk about is serving our enterprise customers. So enterprise, enterprise customers, they had a lot of firewall restrictions. So this is our, um, our first model that we had. So we have our client. Um, they're connecting to our SFU over our TCP. And then they're uh, sending their media traffic over UDP to our turn server. And then that's sending it to our SFU. Um, this was a problem for some of our customers because they're like, hey, we're not, we can't send UDP traffic over our firewall. So we're like, OK, um, we'll allow TCP as a backup on our turn server. And some of our customers still said, hey, we actually can't do that. We need to send our TCP traffic on port 443 and have it encrypted. So then we ended up deploying HAProxy on our box so that HAProxy can um, get media traffic on port 443 and signaling traffic on port 443. And then it can send all the media traffic to our turn, as turn did before. And so turn doesn't have to know anything about it. And it can send all the signaling traffic to our Janus server. So Janus operates in the same way it did. And now we can serve our enterprise customers that we couldn't before because of their restrictive firewalls. 
Um, a, third, a third challenge we faced in building video conferencing at Slack is, is working on Janus. So our SFUs are based off of Janus, and we forked it maybe a couple years ago, so it's a different version of Janus than there is today. Um, and it uses a plugin architecture. So um, there's the core part of Janus that has all the WebRTC stuff, ICE, STAN, um, SDP, et cetera. And then we um, add plugins for applications. So we use the video room plugin because we host video rooms. And that architecture made it difficult for things that we wanted to add, like plan B and simulcast, because there wasn't a clear differentiation of where the data would go. And it was kind of leaking through um, on Janus. And um, it ended up making it really, really difficult to continue to build on Janus and add new features and debug and um, sort out crashes that we we're having. So what we're actually moving towards is the new world of making um, and writing our own server in Elixir. And Elixir is a language, it's um, based off the Erlang VM and it can use all the Erlang libraries. It's a functional programming language, which I think is super fun. And um, one really amazing thing about Elixir is you can utilize the crash tolerance that it has. So in Elixir, you, have, you start up your first process which is your supervisor process. Um, and it spins up other processes, and it watches those processes to see if they're crashing. And then our parent processes can spin up more processes. Um, if one of the processes in the bottom of the tree crashes, the rest of the tree is fine. Everything above it is fine, and it doesn't all crash. So in our example, a lot of our processes are going to be um, like room processes or user processes that have joined a call. If they crash, then the server continues and no other calls on the server are affected. As of right now, if something crashes on our server, the whole server goes down and then has to be brought back up. So that's a really amazing thing about having Elixir. Um, another bonus we get with using Elixir is hot code reloading. So while old clients are connected on a, on a server, if we want to deploy new code, we can do that on the same box new joining users can connect to the new code and we don't have to spin up a bunch of new boxes just to deploy new code, which can save us a lot of money. Um, finally, um, so we realized that using Elixir wasn't all good. There were some downsides and in particular, all the heavy lifting that we needed to do, like encryption and decryption and active speaker detection, it wasn't very performant on the Elixir side. So we've actually moved to a model of using both Elixir and C++. So we use Elixir for the application logic. So um, whenever you have a peer joining, um, joining a room, room creation, they can communicate through a pub-sub mechanism and, um, and subscribe to the events that they want. But we do all the encryption and decryption on the C++ side, as well as active speaker detection, forward error correction, et cetera. All that heavy lifting happens on the C++. Um, we also open up the sockets on the C++ side as well. And we kind of get the best of both worlds of Elixir and C++. And I'll pass it back to Andrew to talk about platform. Thank you, Lindsay. So um, Slack is a platform. And uh, now, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've kind of completed the V1 vision for uh, the first party Slack calling feature. Um, we're really turning our eyes now to expanding the platform uh, in the calling space like it has been for, for the rest of Slack. Um, so right now, there are some limited integrations. Uh, the, this first image here is uh, the button you use to initiate a call, and you can uh, replace uh, first party Slack calls with uh, a number of other providers. Uh, but that's pretty much where the integration ends today. And we want to actually go much richer and, and deeper with that. Um, so the, the second image here is what we call a call object. object sorry, It's a, a message that appears in the channel when uh, a call is ongoing. Uh, and so as one example, we'd like to provide uh, deep integration to uh, third party services to to do what they like with that call object. Um, but in general, we are, want to explore all kinds of different things, like maybe opening up 
the possibility to uh, expose raw audio or video in case uh, you want to do transcription or some kind of image processing for sentiment analysis, um, which can then be fed back into Slack um, as uh, a message to particular users, as, as one example. Um, but we're just starting this off, so uh, we're really looking for your help. If you have any opinions on uh, what you would like this API to look like, we'd really love uh, if you could reach out to us and uh, let us know. Cool. Well, that wraps up our talk. Um, Hopefully you're inspired to come talk to us about uh, third-party IPIs. Also, if you want to nerd out about Elixir after the talk, come talk to us. We'd love to hear from you. And that's it. Thank you.